four spooky stories of royal demons and exorcisms. For millennia, royals have claimed that their right to rule over the unwashed masses was granted to them by God. But a few have been associated with powers originating far south of heaven. Tonight, I'll share with you the spooky and salacious tales of the demon countess who spawned the bloodthirsty Plantagenet dynasty, an unholy canine who ferociously defended his master on the battlefield, a holy Roman emperor who was not very holy and performed black masses on his empress's naked body, and a Spanish king who underwent exorcisms in an attempt to rid himself of his terrible afflictions. The Demon Countess of Anjou King Richard I of England was quite fond of boasting about his family's unholy origins. After a hard day of fighting in the Crusades, the warrior king would sit by the fire with a mug of ale and regale his battle-worn brethren with stories of his mysterious ancestor, the demon Countess of Anjou. In the mid-10th century, Geoffrey Greymantle, Count of Anjou, was one of the most powerful lords in medieval France. While traveling far from home, he became enchanted by a beautiful young maiden. So beguiled was he that he neglected to ask about her family or origins. The couple wed hastily, and Geoffrey conducted his new bride home to take her place as Countess of Anjou. She gave birth to four healthy sons. But as time wore on, Geoffrey grew increasingly concerned about his wife's behavior. In the Middle Ages, life revolved around the church, but the countess often found excuses not to attend. When she couldn't avoid the cathedral, she was inattentive and often skulked away before mass was celebrated and Holy Communion could touch her lips. One Sunday, Geoffrey ordered four of his guards to seize his wife as she rose to leave the church. The countess evaded the guards and grabbed hold of her two younger sons. The count and the congregation looked on in horror as she sprouted black wings, flew up into the air, and crashed out of a high window. The demon countess and her two children would never be seen again, but her tainted bloodline remained. Her eldest son, Fulk, became the next Count of Anjou. He earned the nickname Fulk the Black for his ruthlessness and ferocity in battle and acts of cruelty off the field. When he discovered his wife in an act of adultery, he had her burned at the stake in her wedding dress. This illustration shows Fulk being attacked by the ghosts of his many victims. His violent temper left no doubt that his mother had surely been a spawn of Satan. 200 years later, his descendant, Geoffrey Plantagenet, married Matilda, the daughter of King Henry I of England. Though they hated each other and fought bitterly, together they spawned a dynasty which would rule over England for 300 years. The 15 Plantagenet kings were infamous for their intrigue and bloodshed. They conquered Wales and half of Ireland. They fought fiercely to gain control of Scotland and the Holy Lands, but fell short there. And they battled each other to the death over the crown. Legends of the Demon Countess and the Plantagenet's unholy bloodline serve to enhance their monstrous mystique. King Richard I often embellished the tale by claiming his ancestor was the legendary Melusine, a mythical female water fairy. Much like a mermaid, she had the upper body of a beautiful woman and the tail of a serpent. She often also came complete with the wings of a dragon. Some say the Lady of the Lake from Arthurian legend was one of Melusine's kind. 
Richard, who was himself a fearless and heedless warrior, would always end his tale with this foreboding proclamation about his family. From the devil we came, and to the devil we will go. The one small hiccup in this otherwise marvelously ghoulish tale is the inconvenient fact that Geoffrey Greymantle's wife was not a woman of mysterious origin, but a well-known French noblewoman by the name of Adèle of Mont. She died in unmysterious circumstances in 982 and is buried in St. Aubin's Abbey, Angers. But the demon Countess of Anjou certainly makes for a better tale to tell around a crackling campfire. Happy Halloween, everyone! If, like me, you enjoy the eerier side of history, then join me for a historic group tour of Scotland from May 15th to 21st, 2024. Edinburgh is famous for its ghosts. From medieval specters at Edinburgh Castle to the resurrection men who stalked graveyards in the 1800s. We'll also visit Bronze Age burial chambers at Balnurin of Clava, take a boat to the mystical Isle of Skye, tour highly haunted Aelin Donan Castle, and so much more. And most amazingly, we'll do it all with a group of fellow history lovers and a local guide. Bring a buddy or fly solo, we'll all become friends along the way. There are only a few spots left, so click the link in the description to reserve yours today. Only 25% is due at booking, the rest 90 days before departure. I can't wait to explore spooky history with you in Scotland. The Prince's Poodle from Hell in 1638, 19-year-old Prince Rupert of the Rhine was proving himself on the battlefield of the Thirty Years' War. He wanted his German lands to follow the Protestant faith, and Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand III strongly disagreed. The young prince was captured in battle and imprisoned. He languished in jail and grew depressed, so a friend gave him the gift of two rare hunting poodles, one black and one white, to keep him company. Rupert bonded with the dogs, and soon they followed him everywhere. After three years in prison, the prince was finally released, after he agreed to kiss the emperor's hand and vow never again to take up arms against him. And so, with his poodles following closely at his heels, the prince set sail for England, the homeland of his mother, Elizabeth Stuart. There, he fought to protect the throne of his uncle, King Charles I, from the parliamentarians who wanted to bring down the monarchy. Rupert became one of the most famous cavaliers of the English Civil War, but his dogs were even more infamous. Throughout much of history, dogs often charged into war with their masters. English mastiffs in particular were bred to be fearless warriors. Whenever swords clashed and muskets fired, Rupert's poodles were by his side, biting, scratching, and ripping the throats out of any roundheads who dared to approach their master with lethal intent. The black poodle was killed in battle early in the war, but the white poodle, named Boy, became a dreaded sight on the battlefield, his luminous fur splattered in blood. He inspired many a parliamentarian nightmare. Propaganda pamphlets claimed that Boy was a demon and a witch's familiar. They said that he was invulnerable to attack, could shapeshift into other fearsome creatures, and catch bullets in his teeth. Other tales of his sorcery included sniffing out buried treasure to bolster the king's war efforts and telling the future. It was ventured that Boy was actually a witch from frozen Lapland, who transformed herself into a dog to fight at her lover's side by day, and then slipped into his bed in her human form at night. The royalists became rather proud of the devil dog fighting on their side and made him their mascot. He was trained to lift his leg and piss whenever the names of parliamentarian generals John Pym or Oliver Cromwell were mentioned. 
boy performed for King Charles I and his family and was rewarded by being fed roast beef and chicken from the king's own hand. Boy's fame was so great across Europe that Ottoman Sultan Murad IV sent an ambassador to Germany to find him a dog of the same breed. But demon and among us, or just a fiercely loyal pet, Boy turned out to be merely mortal. In 1644, before the Battle of Marston Moor, Prince Rupert tied Boy up so that he could remain safe in camp. But the dog broke free of his collar and chased after his master. The battle went very badly for the Cavaliers, and Boy was killed in the fight. A historian present at the battle made note of the demise of the much-spoken-of dog, and a woodcutting depicting the poodle's death was widely circulated among the parliamentarians. The war dragged on for another six brutal years, and without the aid of the fearsome fighting poodle, the Cavaliers lost the war and the country, and King Charles I lost his head. I guess boy didn't see that one coming. Prince Rupert was banished from England and went to fight for King Louis XIV of France and later as a privateer in the Caribbean Sea. After the restoration of the throne to his cousin, King Charles II, Rupert returned and was appointed a naval commander. He lived to the relatively ripe old age of 62, but never again did he have such a fiercely loyal and frightening battlefield companion as Boy, the Poodle from Hell. The Unholy Roman Emperor's Black Masses since Charlemagne converted Central Europe to Christianity at sword point and forced Pope Leo III to crown him Holy Roman Emperor, his heirs fought bitterly with popes about everything from land to who had the right to appoint priests and write laws. The Holy Roman Emperor who had the biggest brawl with the papacy was Henry IV. He had good reason to resent the Catholic Church. He inherited the throne in 1054 at the age of four and was kidnapped by the Archbishop of Cologne, who took control of his empire. At the age of 15, Henry was given his first sword. He immediately unsheathed it to attack the Archbishop and drive him from the palace. He took back control of his kingdom by appointing common men loyal to him to powerful positions in the church and government. This outraged Pope Gregory VII, who considered it his right to appoint bishops and abbots. He threatened to excommunicate Henry. The king called his bluff by telling his gang of bishops to declare the pope's election fraudulent. Gregory hadn't been bluffing. He excommunicated Henry. To the faithful, excommunication or exclusion from the kingdom of heaven is a devastating blow, and to a king it meant being stripped of the divine right to rule. However much Henry might have personally disliked the church, he needed their seal of approval to keep his throne. So he staged a brilliant PR move, which came to be known as the Humiliation of Canossa. The king walked barefoot to the city gates where the pope was staying. He supplicated himself on his knees for three days and three nights in a blizzard, refusing food and water. Finally, Henry was allowed to come inside and beg the pope's forgiveness. He was absolved and given communion. But this wasn't enough for the nobility, who had grown to resent Henry for handing out the plum positions they usually received to common people. They elected an anti-king, Rudolph, who put pressure on Pope Gregory to once again excommunicate Henry. Henry's loyal bishops then elected an anti-pope, Clement III. Henry killed anti-King Rudolph in battle and then had the anti-pope crown him Holy Roman Emperor. While battles over the thrones of Charlemagne and St. Peter were raging, Henry reportedly got into some pretty dark stuff. 
when his first wife, Bertha of Savoy, died. He fell in lust with a beautiful nun, Euphraxia of Kiev. He seduced or kidnapped her away from the convent, married her, and kept her locked up, visiting her often. One night, Euphraxia escaped her prison and sought the help of Henry's enemies. She confessed to them a terrifying story of her treatment at the hands of the emperor. Euphraxia claimed that Henry had forced her to participate in orgies and had performed black masses on her naked body in attempts to call the devil to aid him in vanquishing his enemies. Medieval descriptions of black masses designed to parody and pervert the most holy of Catholic rituals often describe them being performed over the naked bodies of women. Minstrel blood was reported to have been used as a sacrament in place of the wine representing the blood of Christ. The 1597 book, The Antichrist, gives this description of a black mass. The man took her to a field. He made a large ring with a rod of holly, muttering a few words which he read from a black book. Thereupon appeared a large horned goat, all black, accompanied by two women and a man dressed as a priest. The goat made him make the sign of the cross with his left hand. The goat had a black candle between his horns, from which the others lit their own candles. The goat took the woman, led her in the woods, and carnally knew her. After that, they began to dance in circles. The man raised a round slice of turnip, dyed black instead of the host, and cried to the elevation, Master, help us. To make holy water, the goat urinated into a hole. The group performed the practices of witchcraft. They were to poison, to bewitch, to blind, to cure illness with charms, to make waste of the fruits of the earth, and other such maladies. Yet another description of a black mass from 1614. And on such nights, the devil says mass. His servants set up an altar with black and ugly altar cloths under figures of the devil. The devil hears the confessions of all the witches who admit as sins the times they had been to church, the good deeds they had done and the evil deeds they had failed to do. His servants sing in hoarse, low and out of tune voices. The devil preaches a sermon to them, and then they go down on their knees and kiss him on his shameful parts and under the tail. The devil lifts up a round black thing and says, this is my body. He gives them communion, which is very sharp to swallow, and drafts of a bitter drink from a black chalice, which chills their hearts. Euphraxia was pregnant, and she was horrified that she didn't know who the baby's father was. She claimed that Henry had offered her to his own son, Conrad, who had refused to commit such a sin. Henry's enemies helped Euphraxia return to Kiev, where she raised her child and lived out the rest of her life. Henry's sons, Conrad and Henry, went to war against their father. Conrad died in battle, but Henry forced his father to abdicate and took his throne. The old king continued to wage war on his son, but became ill and died without receiving absolution from his second excommunication, meaning in his mind he was headed straight for hell. Whether or not Emperor Henry so resented the church that he performed black masses is up for debate, as stories of his diabolical activities are filtered through his enemies, they are not reliable. Such unholy rituals were whispered of throughout the Middle Ages. But the first description I read was from propaganda written by a Catholic about what Protestants were really up to and the second was compiled from the statements of victims of witch trials who were tortured into confessions. 
In the 16th century, Protestant reformers exalted Emperor Henry for standing up to the Pope and defending the rights of the people and of local governments to make their own laws. Henry IV is considered by some to have been the first Protestant. The Exorcisms of the King of Spain King Felipe IV of Spain was desperate for an heir. He had no brothers and nine of his children had died tragically while still in their cradles. In 1644, his queen, Elizabeth of France, weakened by her many pregnancies, died at 41. Two years later, her only surviving son, 16-year-old Balthazar Charles, succumbed to a mysterious malady. The 44-year-old king resolved to marry his son's fiance, his own niece, 14-year-old Mariana of Austria. The new queen lost four babies in quick succession. Desperate, Felipe visited an astronomer who gave him a prophecy that his next child would be a living son. He ate only eggs for a month in superstition, hoping that the prediction would come true. And finally, Mariana gave birth to a son who was strong enough to live. All of Spain rejoiced. The future of the monarchy was at last secure, and civil war over the throne narrowly avoided. Royal proclamations went out far and wide describing the new prince, Carlos, as a robust child, very handsome, with proportionate head and black hair. But a report from the French ambassador to Louis XIV tells a different story. The child is extremely weak. He has sores on both cheeks. His head is covered with scabs and a kind of channel or drainage that oozes under the right ear. Charles did not learn to talk until the age of four or walk until eight. His poor health was kept secret from the public. Some in the palace whispered that King Felipe must have made a deal with the devil to secure himself an heir. When poor Infanta Carlos was five, his father died and he became King of Spain. The new monarch's maladies were now of even greater concern to his people. He suffered from multiple physical, intellectual, and emotional problems. His tutors struggled to teach him to read and write, and he was prone to throwing tantrums throughout his life. He had a condition called mandibular prognathism, where the lower jaw protrudes, causing the upper and lower teeth to misalign. This condition was common among his kin and was known as the Habsburg jaw. Carlos's was so severe that he was unable to speak properly, or chew his food, and often vomited it back up. In the minds of his 17th century courtiers, there could only be one explanation for the king's many debilitating disorders. Witchcraft. Like a character in a fairy tale, it was believed that the king had been cursed from birth, and he became known as El Equizado, or the Hexed. And if demons had been loosed to feast on the body and mind of the unfortunate monarch, then surely the power of faith could set him free. Royal counselors sent far and wide for exorcists to come to the palace and liberate the king from the spirits that tormented him. Many a priest and mystic prayed over him or attempted to question the demons who possessed him. One such cleric claimed to have spoken to a goblin who lurked within the palace walls. The Bogart bragged that he had forced the king to drink the brain of a dead man dissolved in a chocolate bowl, and he howled with triumphant laughter. Holy relics, the bones belonging to St. Isidore and St. Iago, were brought to the king's bedside in the hopes that proximity to the divine would cure him. Even the bones of his own dead father were removed from his crypt and placed in the king's bedroom. 
But alas, none of these ghoulish treatments were able to grant the king vitality or even relief. At 18, Carlos was wed to the beautiful Marie-Louise d'Orléans. He fell desperately in love with her, and she could barely stand to look at him. She drowned her sorrows in sweets and was fed mysterious fertility potions, one or both of which caused her to die of appendicitis at 26. Next, the king was wed to Maria Anna of Nuremberg. The new queen was under enormous pressure to bear a child, but this was unlikely to happen as her husband was impotent. Naturally, the blame for failing to produce an heir fell only on Maria Anna. She claimed to be pregnant on numerous occasions, and when it became clear that she was not, she pressured Carlos to undergo even more exorcisms. She argued that she could only bear him a child when his demons had been expelled. At 38, his life finally came to an end. The doctor who performed his autopsy recorded that his body did not contain a single drop of blood, his heart was the size of a peppercorn, his lungs corroded, his intestines rotten and gangrenous, he had a single testicle black as coal, and his head was full of water. Carlos II of Spain was indeed cursed not by a demon, but by the House of Habsburg's many generations of inbreeding. For hundreds of years, royals across Europe exclusively married other royals, but the two branches of the Habsburg family, which ruled Spain and the Holy Roman Empire, were particularly notorious for volleying brides back and forth like ping-pong balls. The Habsburgs wed to forge treaties and to consolidate their wealth and power, and they wouldn't think of mixing their sacred blood with that of mere commoners. Carlos II's parents were uncle and niece, and all of his great-grandparents were descendants of the same couple, Queen Juana the Mad and Philip the Handsome. The science of genetics, founded two centuries after Carlos's death, revealed that the royals' elitist marriage practices actually led to their downfall. Without fresh DNA, numerous genetic problems compounded and worsened from generation to generation. Exorcism couldn't save King Carlos II of Spain. Neither could it save his kingdom. As he was the last of the male line of the Spanish Habsburgs, his death led to the War of Spanish Succession. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.